Thank you, Mr. Malsoma. Uh, now it's my turn uh, to say my two bit in, uh, in the, for the seminar. Uh, during the course of the last uh, nine sessions, one and a half days, I think we have all heard uh, about the tremendous potential uh, that the opportunities that are uh, there in Mizoram to be harvested by us. And uh, the potential for economic growth of the state. I would, I'm not, uh, I'm supposed to speak on industry and uh, industry and trade, but I, I, I think I'll, I'll digress a bit from that. Uh, I just want to say some issues uh, of concern which I have come across as a policy maker for the government. And uh, at the same time, I would attempt to provoke this house into some serious soul searching and uh, introspection because when we say that we are the gateway to Southeast Asia, uh, I would like to pose a question and ask whether we are ready for it, whether we have the mindset to capture this opportunity, whether we have created the ecosystem that will help us in exploiting this opportunity. Now, uh, as students of economics, uh, we are taught that there are four uh, basic factors of production, land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. Uh, I would like to dwell on each one of these factors and, and try to examine how stacked we are as a state in all these respects. Let us first take land. Area of Mizoram is approximately about uh, 20, 21,000 square kilometers. With a, we have a population of about 1.1 billion, million, sorry. So that works out to be, if each and every one of us is given a portion of this land, we would have about a per capita uh, allotment of 1,800 uh, uh, square meters of land, which is adequate to build a palatial house with space to spare. But is there really land available for industrial development or for any other development project? The sad truth is that through the, down through the years, our village councils, without having the legal authority, have been distributing land to whoever, is, whoever has the money. We have reached such a situation that all development projects taken up by the government or by private individuals run into cost and time overruns because of compensation issues. Let us take the case of the Kaladan multimodal project. We have reached such a ridiculous situation that the amount of land for which compensation has been claimed is said to be more than the area of Mizoram. Yeah, we can laugh, but what are the costs we have suffered on account of this? We need to have a deep look inside us and question, how can we be so greedy? We need some major land reforms. The government is aware of it. We are moving towards uh, new legislations to, uh, for land acquisitions and other related issues. Let us move on to the next factor, 
that is labor. Labor is essential for any industrial or any activity. Mizoram suffers from being one of the highest uh, wage economies. This immediately places us at a disadvantage when we are producing goods because we cannot sell our products outside because they're not price competitive. We need to address this issue. Now, uh, that's a big this thing. Somebody uh, before me talked about labor productivity, labor efficiency. A state which boasts of being the third highest in, lit in terms of literacy within, in India. We talk about how well we are doing in education, but like Mr. Uh, sorry, Mr. Prasad said he cannot find local people to work on his farms. That is the situation we have reached. We need to look inwards and see what ails us. Increasing labor productivity will, to some extent, offset the cost of high wages. But there is a limit to how much that it can achieve. Also, increasing labor productivity means investments. That brings us to the next factor, that is capital. Mizoram is deficient in capital. So, if we want investments, we need to seek capital from outside the state. But are we ready to do that? We have an industrial policy which says that anybody who wants to set up an industry has to have a local partner. That itself is a big discouragement for anyone who would like to invest in the state. We are afraid of competition. We want to live and operate in a cloistered economy. Talk about entrepreneurship. Yes, we have very good traders. But trading can get you only so far and no further. We need to have industries. We need to develop our industries, our service sector. How do we develop our entrepreneurship? We need to operate in a competitive environment. We need to open up our economy and not say that we will not allow outsiders to trade because a closed economy will not make us world beaters. Let us take the example of India itself. Before 1991, we were almost bankrupt. That was the time when we were following a socialist model of development. We need to change that, and we did. Now look at us. We are, India is being touted as one of the fastest growing economies in the world. And by 200, 2050, it is projected that we'll be overtaking the economies of USA itself. That is what liberalization and a competitive environment uh, gives you. These are problems which uh, the government is aware of. And the government is working to bring solutions. But there is a limit to which policy interventions by the government uh, can have an effect. The real push needs to come from us, the citizens, from civil society, from NGOs, from the church. Everybody, every one of us has to work together for this. I'm glad to see a lot of students uh, having uh, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, during the seminar, because what we are trying to address here is for the future of these students. But I would I also like to uh, put in a word of caution. Because as students, you should be careful about who you select to represent you. 
you cannot have a economy, a vibrant economy with competitive spirit and entrepreneurship if the student organizations that represent you act like extortionists and collect donations forcibly from traders from outside the state. It's a big damper. It's a big damper. As long as we have this attitude, we will not be in a position to attract any meaningful outside investment. We talk about the potential of tourism. Tourism is a 24-7 activity. But then, come Sunday, and everything shuts down. The church also needs to have a look at this. Because if we develop the tourism industry, and incomes increase, it's a win-win situation for all of us. The one out of 10, which we religiously contribute to the church, will multiply. So it's good. I think that's good for both of us, for the state, for the people, as well as for the church. So uh, those are just some uh, issues I would like to raise, because uh, we cannot keep on sweeping all these issues under the carpet, because one day that carpet will be so bumpy that it's going to trip us. We need to look, take a good, hard look at ourselves and try to come up with solutions, all of us together. We cannot just leave everything to the government. We need to work together for the prosperity of this state. Thank you. I request you to join me and give them a good clap because uh, I, I think they've done a wonderful job. And I struggle to find entrepreneurs. The two sitting in front of you, if they can do it, you can do it. But you've got to try hard and you've got to work much harder. And uh, I must congratulate uh, Puzotan Kuma because. Uh, I think he's spoken frankly and from the heart. Notwithstanding, he is the Commissioner of Commerce and Industries of Mizoram. But uh, everything they've said, we will put into the report. Thank you so very much. That, that's a wonderful job done. Thank you. Uh, before we have lunch, I must tell you that today's session is much more productive than yesterday. Yesterday was all speakers. But today, after lunch, is questions, answers. You all have to question, and we all have to answer. Or find answers together. Please don't go missing in the afternoon. Please come back after lunch. Be here sharp at 2.30. The, the next session will be chaired by Reverend Dr. Lalchun Nunga. And speaker would be Dr. Jane Ralte. We are allowed to start. Good afternoon, everyone. Post lunch session is usually a very interesting session. I'd like to request everyone to be alert and to keep yourselves awake because you're going to have very important uh, discussion. There'll be an open, open house time after the speech by Dr. Jane, my speech will be just short uh, after all the open house sessions will be over. <clears throat> I'm happy to uh, tell something about Dr. Jane Ralte. She and Mrs. Lal Riliani, the wife of our Honorable Chief Minister, Mr. Lal Tanhola, are living symbols of anti tobacco campaign in Mizoram. So she's the right person to speak about uh, this anti-tobacco health, anti-tobacco and 
drug addiction. She has been working with the government of Mizoram for 25 years and has made her uh, contributions very real in health uh, ministry. And she has been to her, she has, she is having to her credit the very rare uh, thing about her projects being accepted and funded by Bloomberg initiatives. And she's, she has been traveling to different places in uh, a number of countries, participating in uh, seminars, making presentations in those seminars. So she's the right person. She's the state nodal officer for National Tobacco Control Program, Mizoram State Tobacco Control and Control Society, Health and Family Welfare Mizoram. And she is also a med deputy medical superintendent, state referral hospital at Falcon in Mizoram. So most qualified person to speak on the topic. Now we'll give time to her and uh, she has something like 15 minutes or so. I don't think she needs to be warned to stop. She knows her time limit, and she's going to make her presentation now. Let's call upon Dr. Jane Valde. Let's welcome her with a big hand. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Respected dignitaries, guests, faculty, students, and all the people who are here today, on behalf of the Mizoram State Tobacco Control Society, I bring you greetings. Today I will be talking about the impact of tobacco use in Mizoram. Uh, I will really not touch upon the drug problem. <clears throat> that is too huge a problem. And uh, my expertise lies in tobacco control, so I will be confining myself to <clears throat> tobacco control. Uh, Mrs. Lal Riliani, the Chief Minister's uh, wife, is the president of the Indian Society on Tobacco and Health. She's not here today, but she conveys her warm greetings and uh, <clears throat> uh, expresses her uh, best wishes to each and every one of you who are here today. Um, so without much ado, I will get into my presentation. Uh, in case I run out of time beyond 15 minutes, I request the chair to, to warn me because sometimes it's easy to get carried away when you're talking about something that you're really passionate about. So please bear with me. Uh, let's start with the tobacco epidemic uh, all over the world. Let's, I'll, let me try and give you a global picture before uh, I get into what is the picture in Mizoram and in the Northeast. <clears throat> As you can see, tobacco is the only legally available consumer product which kills people when it is used entirely as intended. So if it is made for smoking, people smoke it, and it kills them because of that. If it is made as a smokeless form, as a snuff, or in whatever form, it kills when it is used in exactly as intended. Why I'm emphasizing on this is because in Mizoram, we have this, we used to have this problem with proxivan injection. Now proxivan is not meant, was never meant to be injected. But the youth in Mizoram, they were very innovative. Uh, it's innovative gone wrong, but they were very innovative. And they started using it to inject themselves. So they were not using it for the purpose for which it was intended. So that is different from tobacco. <clears throat> now tobacco worldwide kills about six million people each year, of which about, as you can see, more than five millions are current users and people who have used tobacco earlier. They might have quit but they still face the repercussion of the tobacco use in their health. It always has some impact. And about six lakh people are non-smokers, you know, vulnerable women and children and non-smokers who are exposed to other people's smoke and because of that, they die. So we have about this huge number of people who suffer because of other people's smoke. So, what they have said is the estimate is that tobacco has killed about 100 million people in the 20th century. And unless we do something about it now, in the 21st century, it'll kill 1 billion people. And the saddest part is that all these deaths are preventable. All we need to do is just say no to tobacco and not use it. So we'll be able to prevent all these deaths. 
Now, let me bring you closer home to India. As you can see, this is the Global Adult Tobacco Survey report of 2009-10. This is the latest uh, report as of now. The second round of GATS is being taken up. It has started in some states. In Mizoram, it has not started, but we expect it to be uh, taken up any time this month, next month, within this year. Uh, so GATS 2009-10 has shown the tobacco use prevalence in all the or in all the states of the country and the union territories of the country. So as you can see, Mizoram unfortunately is number one in a really bad indicator. Tobacco use prevalence, we are 67%, number one in the country. We are followed by Nagaland, but if you can see the figures, it's 57. So there's a huge 10% difference between Nagaland and Mizoram. But if you see the one, the states which I've highlighted, <clears throat> Mizoram, Nagaland, Tripura third, Meghalaya fourth, Manipur fifth, Arunachal, Sikkim, Assam. Now you see this blue line here, 35%. This is the national average. So in India, the national average is that about 35 people of every 100 use tobacco in some form. But all the states in the Northeast, since we're talking about Northeast region and what we can do from this region. So you see how much we needs to be done for tobacco because the tobacco use is so high in all the states of the Northeast. It is a matter of concern and we need to know this. Now the population of Mizoram, as we say roughly, <clears throat> as per 2011 census is about 11 lakhs. If you calculate, extrapolate those figures to 67%, it comes up to about 5 lakh 41,000 people using tobacco in Mizoram. So our 67% is about that much. Um, so that is about a general figure. Now let's see the gender breakup if, of states in the Northeast. As you can see, Mizoram is very high with 73% of males uh, using tobacco, 62% of females using tobacco in different forms. Uh, smoke form, smokeless form, all different forms. And now, if you can see, Meghalaya is, uh, has the same uh, figures as uh, Mizoram for males, but Mizo women stand out. I mean, we really stand out in a bad way where tobacco use is concerned, at 62%. But as you can see, the rest of the Northeast is also uh, really uh, high for both men and women. <clears throat> now, Mizoram in particular, if you see, uh, males, we have already said it's 73%. Uh, overall, smoked form is more common with, with 59% uh, of men smoking. Smokeless is a little bit uh, uncommon, less common uh, among men at 33, but 33% is still very, very high because the figures in brackets are the national figures. Now in women, 62% <clears throat> of women use tobacco in some form. Smoke form is relatively less at 19, but if you see from the national uh, figures, it is much higher for even for Mizo women. Smokeless form is more common among women in the Northeast, uh, in, in Mizoram. So this uh, is a picture of the tobacco use, the type, and uh, the use among both, both men and women. Now, a little bit about secondhand smoke uh, exposure. The, this is again, from uh, GATS, they have said that the secondhand smoke exposure at home is very high. It is the highest in the country at 96.5, which means about 97% of homes in Mizoram are not safe because they're exposed to second, because people are smoking inside our homes. This is where the students need to wake up. This is where the younger generation needs to wake up. As we said, it kills about six million, peop uh, six lakh people worldwide. In Mizoram, the figure would definitely be higher because of this very, very high uh, exposure. Uh, figures in brackets, again, are the national figures. So you can see our Mizoram figure is alarmingly high. It is double that of the national figures. At workplace, is 62%. In government buildings, is 10, about 11%. Now, this is something, okay, let me talk about this first. <clears throat> Awareness about secondhand smoke. You know, this, this survey asked households, they were, it's a household survey. And this survey went to every household, and they asked them about what are the effects of secondhand smoke. And 
Mizo in Mizoram, the awareness is really high. People were aware. Even in villages, they were aware that smoking causes lung cancer. 98%, we have the highest awareness level in the country. All right. They believe that exposure to secondhand smoke causes serious illnesses in non-smokers. We're very aware of that, 93%. But this last point, how many are allowed smoking at home? A very high 98%. So what are we doing with the knowledge that we have? We are not able to actually translate that into our, you know, be, uh, our behavior. We are not able to change it. Maybe it has something to do with the way we are culturally. You know, we are not the type to go and fight with people or point fingers at them. That is a very uh, uh, non-meso uh, behavior. But I think we now need to come out of that and uh, you know, really step out and say, look, secondhand smoke is bad. You cannot smoke in our house. You cannot smoke in the car. You cannot smoke in the bus. This is something that we really need to do. <clears throat> now, again, I'll just be talking about Mizoram. <laughs> In uh, 2011, this is the statistical abstract of Mizoram 2011, which is issued by the Directorate of Economics and Statistics. This has shown that the top five diseases by which people in Mizoram are dying, number one is cancer, two, malaria, third is bronchitis and chronic cough, fourth is pneumonia, fifth is stomach and duodenal diseases. Now, if you see the, all the diseases which I've highlighted in red, these are all tobacco-related diseases except for malaria. So you can see that the high consumption of tobacco in any form, because we're the highest, it is no wonder that our diseases, tobacco-related diseases are also the, cause, the causes of the high uh, um, to tobacco-related diseases incidence in Mizoram. So this is 2011. Now 2014, this is the latest. If you see, again, all the diseases in red are tobacco related diseases diseases of liver number one number two cancer heart diseases hypoxia birth asphyxia and other respiratory conditions basically means that the child the baby is not getting enough oxygen the baby's uh, uh, lungs are not working uh, properly for some reason and because of that they're having uh, lung problem so a lot of our babies are dying, children are dying because of that. Six is tuberculosis. About 40% of tuberculosis cases is because of smoking or because they inhale secondhand smoke. All right, so again, tobacco, re to tobacco use contributes very highly to tu tuberculosis. Then we have pneumonia, renal failure. You may not believe it, but tobacco use is one of the leading causes of renal failure anywhere. So, all the diseases in red, again, as you can see, are because of tobacco. So this shows it comes, it comes together, it collaborates, that uh, tobacco kills people, it causes diseases, and it kills people. Now let's concentrate on cancer. This is from the three years report of population-based cancer registry 2006-7, then subsequently 9 and 11, then I'll come to the latest one. <clears throat> as you can see, these are the cancers where Mizoram is number one in India. In these cancers, we are number one in the country. So cancer of all sides, nose and throat. Again, all the ones in red are the ones which are caused by tobacco. There's a special term for that. It's called tobacco-related cancer. Nose and throat, lung, esophagus, the food pipe, the stomach, cervical cancer. Nose and throat, all the same, even over here. So 2000. 6, 7, and then subsequently 9, 11, and now 2012, 14 shows that, again, we, st we have the dubious distinction of having the highest position in these cancers. Male cancer lung, female lung, male and female colon cancer, second position in female throat, male stomach, female stomach, male and female, uh, sorry, male colon, male and female lung, and female cervical cancer. So again, you can see the impact that a tobacco use has on this deadly disease in causing this deadly disease called cancer. And we know that cancer is a really ugly, deforming, a terrible disease, debilitating disease. We have to spend so much of money. And because the detection may be a little bit late, many people ultimately die even though they take treatment. They die very soon. They are not even able to complete their treatment. <clears throat> so the mouth and the throat and the esophagus, these are all the tobacco-related cancers which I've been talking about. So those pictures were to kind of wake you up. I hope it has waken you, waken you all up. And we do have this same, uh, same picture in many of the states in the Northeast. 
the economic aspect, one slide, uh, there are two slides on the economics. <clears throat> one is that the daily expenditure on tobacco is really, really high. If you can see tobacco smokers, if we, it has been estimated that in Mizoram they spend about 21 rupees and 20 pesa. So daily it comes up to about 42.67 lakhs. <clears throat> Smokeless, sorry, BD or Zozial, Zozial is the Mizo version of BD. So supposing they spend 7 rupees and 30 pesa, <clears throat> In a day, the expenditure by these smokers is about four lakh, uh, sorry, two lakh forty-one thousand. Smokeless form is about fifteen lakh eighty-five thousand. So altogether, in a day, we spend in Mizoram about sixty point nine three lakhs. In a month, so you can see the calculation. So it is a huge burden that we are actually uh, bearing. The huge amount of money that is being spent on tobacco, and this is without the estimating, uh, well, the other local tobacco products, which is quite uh, a lot. OK, <clears throat> this, we had, this is just uh, saying that about 718 rupees is spent per month individually. So OK, now, government of Mizoram spends about 81.7 crore on medical referrals. And these are all reimbursed. It's borne by the government of Mizoram. And we did a study in 2009 where we found that about 61, about 62 percent of the patients who are referred from out from Mizoram were tobacco users. So most of the diseases which they for which they referred are actually being caused by the use of tobacco. So if we indirectly, if we reduce tobacco use, that uh, the expenditure to be borne by the government will also is also expected to go down. Now we have this. Uh, a problem of tobacco contraband, which many of the states in the Northeast, which shares international borders, face. So this is another aspect where we have economic loss because of tobacco, uh, cig uh, tobacco cig uh, contraband cigarettes. <clears throat> the taxation department says that they lose about uh, 2,138 lakhs annually because of the tobacco contraband, because they do not give uh, taxes. Economic Offense Wing has estimated it to be about this much. So whichever is the correct figure, their, their sources are different. But it's a huge amount of money which is, uh, is uh, just being lost to the government. Uh, this is an economic uh, offense. Uh, <clears throat> a little bit about the cessation. With such a high percentage of people using tobacco, we need to offer cessation services. And this is what we have done in Mizoram. Under the National Tobacco Control Program, we have established tobacco cessation clinics in uh, eight, uh, sorry, in all the nine health, actually we have nine health districts. Uh, administratively there are eight, but we have nine uh, health districts. So we have uh, established TCCs in all these places, and we uh, have started getting good uh, amount, number of people coming to us who want to quit. So uh, I'm, I'm presenting it today because we have a problem. Cessation is something that we need to, cessation services are something that we need to <clears throat> address. And I want uh, people here to go back and uh, to talk about it and to uh, refer clients, tobacco users, to our clinic. What WHO says about you know, this is that the best law is one that so shapes social norms that it becomes self-enforcing. Now, that is what we need in Mizoram. We had a meeting from 12 o'clock in the Mizoram University uh, uh, office, one, the offices were, which is uh, opposite in the admin building with the anti-tobacco squad of the Mizoram University. And they were talking about how difficult it is, how vast the campus is. So it's impossible, actually, if we're going to, if we have, if we expect <clears throat> that the police or the security or somebody who's the anti-tobacco squad members are going to come and check each and every one, each and every area, each and every building. It is impossible. So what is, what is needed is that the movement has to be from the society. So it needs to change the social norms. And people need to be able to start saying, hey, you cannot smoke there. This is not a good place for you to smoke. Excuse me, please go out. Now, that is something that in Mizoram we need to move towards. So we need to change our social norms. And we need to become, it needs to become a self-enforcing mechanism so that it brings about social change process where the change in tobacco use or the habit or the intentions and attitudes, all this go hand in hand with the legislation and it goes hand in hand with the regulatory bodies. As I said, all of it has to come together nicely. It has to, we have all got to work in tandem. So all of us need to work together so that we're able to have a better tobacco control in Mizoram, in Mizoram University, in every home throughout the Northeastern uh, region. <clears throat> 
Now, why is tobacco use so important? And in the context of the larger tobacco use problem, I just wanted to show this slide, which uh, shows that tobacco and alcohol are the gateway drugs. You know, usually, uh, Drug, uh, drug addicts don't immediately start injecting themselves. They start off, it is, it is a step ladder kind of thing. They start off with tobacco, maybe they smoke, maybe they use the uh, smokeless form, they, maybe they start using gutka, then from there they start using alcohol, and it escalates up to higher other drugs, injecting and other things. So this is a step ladder thing, and if you're going to be able to have a proper drug policy in place, we need to address the issue of tobacco use. Sadly, in Mizoram, I mean, it saddens me to say this, but we kind of say, okay, tobacco is, uh, just keep it aside. Like, let's ignore it. And then we go after the uh, other drugs. But as you can see from this figure, you cannot uh, tackle drugs in isolation from tobacco. This is something that we need to really think about. What we learned uh, the other day when we had a meeting with the uh, legal metrology people was that, a number of the tobacco uh, cigarettes, contrabands, which is being smuggled in from uh, mainly from Myanmar, they actually change the vehicle, they modify it, and they really pack it with uh, contraband cigarette. And they said that uh, they they suspect that among this consignment of tobacco cigarettes, that they feel that other drugs also would be getting you know uh, smuggled in. So it goes hand in hand. So these are some of the reasons why we need to address the issue of tobacco control in Mizoram if we're going to make a good headway in uh, uh, control of drugs usage in the state on a, uh, in an effective manner. <clears throat> so what needs to be done for the northeastern region? My, my say is that one is that we need to have a very good and very strong tobacco control program in all the states. It cannot just be Mizoram in isolation or Assam in isolation. It has to be in the Northeast. And these should be based on scientific protocols. Now, these scientific protocols are already available with the World Health Organization Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. So these are available. Let's do things scientifically. We do not need to reinvent the cycle. It is no rocket science. It is everything is already there. Let us do something uh, about this on a regional basis. Number two is we need to enforce the existing Tobacco Control Act. We call it COTPA, Cigarettes and Other Tobacco Products Act. <clears throat> we need to effectively enforce this. Then the third is that uh, the, there's a growing menace of tobacco contraband, cigarette contraband, basically, which is coming in from the neighboring countries. So as I've already mentioned, tax evasion, economic offense, other drugs trafficking, all these are part of uh, the entire thing. So we need to start saying, OK, tobacco contraband, cigarette contraband is something that we really need to you know, address. Then there's also flow in the opposite direction. Very popular uh, tobacco products like gutka, you know, khani. These are all going into our neighboring states. So it's like, you know, back and forth. They were exchanging different kinds of poisons. So these are some of the things that we need to uh, address. Then we need more research uh, on tobacco use in Mizoram and the Northeast region. And in order to have a tobacco-free Northeast region, uh, if we have a tobacco-free Northeast region, we will have a healthier uh, Northeast region. So let's not beat around the bush. Let us beat the bush. That is something that we need to do now. So with that, I thank you for your patience, and I hope I've been able to address a little bit of the issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jane, for your clear presentation of the fact that Northeastern region is not doing very well. So far as tobacco use is concerned, and on top of that, Mizoram, it's not a great thing to have the highest uh, tobacco use rate uh, in the whole of the country. Um, now, it is going to be an open house time, but before we open uh, questions and answers for all the topics that have been discussed, uh, maybe not necessarily with specific re reference to any particular topic, uh, it may be a general uh, question, which is, of course, relevant to the purpose of, to the aims and objectives of our seminar. Uh, let us bear in mind that we should not stray too far away from 
the purpose and objectives of the seminar. That is uh, Mizoram Gateway to Southeast Asia. What needs to be done? What needs to be done? I think we will have to focus ourselves uh, particularly on what needs to be done. It, it takes a singular form, but it may be a plural also, plurality of so many things that are needed to be done. Uh, we can think about so many things. Um, uh, first, let us spend something like five minutes or so if there are any questions about this very presentation that we just had from Jane. Yes, please. Uh, can the mic be given, please? <coughs> oh, uh, before we start, I'd like to request any, anyone raising question or giving answers to identify yourself. Uh, hello. Um, uh, quite interesting presentation, ma'am. Um, I appreciate your presentation very much, and uh, I feel that we should make uh, this kind of presentation as, as a lesson uh, in school education. Uh, we, we, we need a lot of awareness um, among our children, teenage children, and the students about this. Um, and, and you made a, a, a calculation that uh, how much uh, our state uh, is spending. Um, on smoking, right? It is quite frightening. Uh, but but uh, have you have you included uh, the health cost involved? Because um, <laughs> so I, I think if you could in, if you could uh, include the health cost, uh, the likely health cost uh, to be involved um, in the life of a smoker, and it would be much more frightening. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. Uh, I am Jyoti Kumar, professor of commerce. Mizoram University. We can take any other question? One or two more? If no more questions, let's have a response to that. Thank you, Professor Jyoti Kumar. Uh, the, regarding your suggestion about the lessons in school, in textbooks, it has been taken up. Uh, in fact, uh, <clears throat> the new syllabus is about to come out, which uh, SCRT is uh, preparing. So we have submitted the uh, lesson plans and uh, everything. Uh, so they're going to be including it in classes 6, 7, 8. And it was already there in class 4 and in class 9. So we're trying to uh, get different messages about tobacco and drug use uh, in every class, in different uh, subjects. So that is uh, the first point. You're very right. When I said that this is the cost of using just tobacco, uh, that is just the amount which is spent by people on buying tobacco, and we have not included the health costs and other things because we actually do not really have a local study. And in fact, uh, when I visited <clears throat> Mizoram University, I asked the you know people here, let's have some study going because you you are the uh, people in the right place you know academically who can take up research we really need to have local data especially about the economics about how much exactly people are spending in uh, in mizoram on healthcare but the figure i gave you about the uh, 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 government of Mizoram spending so much on uh, medical reimbursement that is just a tip of the iceberg because that does not reflect the entire population Thank you. Thank you for the question and for the response. Uh, now we'll open the house for any questions uh, referring to any of the topics that have been discussed yesterday, today, and any other relevant topic, topics that you would like to refer to. Uh, now time is open. But as I said, please identify yourself first and then ask questions. My name is Bilal Chandama, student from Economic Department. And uh, a few comments. Uh, 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 yesterday, when uh, I see the topic Mizoram Gateway to Southeast Asia, there is a question in my heart. Why? Why not the other state, the other northeast uh, state? Uh, why 
Sea Nurse, Kolkata prefer Mizoram for the gateway to Southeast Asia. But after this whole seminar, uh, I understand that Mizoram is the only gate uh, to Southeast Asia for trade. Because if, uh, if you look at the left, uh, this left uh, picture, if you see Arunachal Pradesh, uh, as we all know, frankly speaking, there is uh, something with China we know. And from the defense strategic point of view, uh, if, we, if we construct highways and uh, railways to Beijing or mainland, mainland China, if there is any conflict, uh, our profit from interna international trade will uh, need to employ more battalion of regiment uh, during conflict. So it is not beneficial uh, from, uh, uh, from the def defense point of view and from the economic point of view Arunachal is high, higher in altitude so the, the construction cost for highways and railways is much higher and also from the seaport from uh, Calcutta seaport or Chittagong seaport or Shitwe seaport from Myanmar it is very far fr uh, from Arunachal so uh, Mizoram has uh, greater uh, opportunity in this point and also, if we, if we see uh, Nagaland or Meghalaya or Manipur, uh, there is a lot of insurgency and gang and rebel group, a, a youth with AK-47. So if we have international trade uh, through other states, uh, a large portion of uh, profit will go to the rebels. So to fight rebels and insurgency, our profit is needed uh, to employ more battalions of regiment and assault uh, rifle. So, if we choose Mizoram, there is no insurgency or there is no gang. So, uh, our profit will be 100% profit. And uh, from the defense point of view, also, uh, the boundary of Myanmar and Mizoram is uh, divided by river known as Triau. So, there is no conflict in international boundary with Myanmar and. Also with Bangladesh, our boundary is divided with uh, Chimtuibui River. And this, there is no uh, border conflict with Bangladesh. So uh, it is uh, from the defense point of view, from the political stability point of view, or from the economic point of view also, uh, if we use Mizoram, not only China, we can trade with uh, Burma, uh, Burma, and through Burma, we can trade with Laos, Vietnam, uh, uh, Thailand, etc. So Mizoram is the best. Uh, uh, from this seminar, I know that uh, Mizoram is the best point. And, and also that if we can construct a railway and highways through Tripura, Bangladesh, through Assam and West Bengal, so we can access Southeast Asia uh, uh, shorter distance and uh, the transportation cost will be less and the price for uh, commodity and, and the trade, the profit of trade will be higher, and the price of commodity will be lower. And uh, but yeah, uh, the second topic: what needs to be done? Uh, in Mizoram, our main problem is connectivity, like highways, railways, uh, telecommunication, etc. And but uh, yesterday, our honourable chief minister uh, said that due to 1966 to 1986 insurgency uh, there is uh, the uh, in uh, the uh, infrastructure is hampered by that insurgency he said that but uh, from 1986 to 2016 there are 30 years and uh, 30 years is has gone so till now we, we are underdeveloped in infrastructure so uh, our need First is infrastructure. Uh, to extract mineral oil or petroleum or to export vegetables uh, or uh, to exchange trade uh, or com to, to exchange commodity or service, uh, we need uh, roads and highways, uh, railways, etc. So, but our main problem is how to have uh, this connectivity. We, uh, we, can, we, can, we are high in uh, liter literacy. We are high in educated. Uh, most of the Mizou uh, students can speak English fluently, but uh, we can develop our entrepreneur skills and labor skills, but without transportation. Yeah. 
trade cannot be done. Exchange of ideas or information or uh, goods cannot be done without connectivity. But how can we? Uh, how can we have uh, connectivity uh, with laser time? Because uh, the gas station period for connectivity is very fast and the co uh, corruption, mismanagement, etc., and lack of political uh, will hamper the uh, construction of this connectivity. So uh, my question is that how can we improve our connectivity to improve all the human resource development, entrepreneurship skills, or trade, etc.? Thank you. It's very encouraging that the first response, the first question comes from a student. I think uh, the student community, please come up with your questions. Yes. I, Babuji, assistant professor in the Department of Public Administration, Hi. MZU. My question is, yesterday we heard a lot about skill development. So if we talk about skill development, what are the mechanisms and institutions involved? Which sector, in which sector skill development and capacity development? Who are the target groups? So anybody can answer. I think the experts spoke a lot about this. Thank you. Good evening to all. I'm Devendran, professor from the Department of Social Work. I have been here for the last two days. I'm listening. It was wonderful. Uh, Eye opener for me to disc have a discussion with regard to the international border, what is happening. So, in this context, again, what uh, Mr. Uh, Babu asked, in that same way, my question is that since uh, the young, the youth in Mizoram context itself, the 40% of the population is uh, young population, in that regard, uh, most of them we have been listening, an uh, educated, unemployed youth problem is also very high. So in that context, skill development, most of them are sp speaking about this uh, skill development and entrepreneurship development. In this regard, this is my submission to this uh, CENARC that baseline survey is needed in this regard. Reason, skill-oriented things, what are the skills are essential for these young people? In this context, with regard to trade and commerce, so some, without venturing, uh, venturing into this context, some baseline survey is needed in order to identify what skills are essential and what type of skills they have accordingly in order to help the young minds. Mr. Chairman, I'm a CMD of New Tech Bamboo Project Private Limited from Entrepreneur. So I have a three question, please. Can we remove this, the present EPCG license or issuing authority there in Shillong? I will, I will clarify it first. The present EPCG license issuing authority, DGFT Shillong, can be issued up to only two crore value. If we purchase the machine more than two, above two crore, then we cannot import. That is after the Indian independent. Uh, the, uh, the Shillong DGFT can issue only up to two crore EPCG license. Number two, can we increase the item of import from uh, Champai Zokhothar to Myanmar? The present item is very simple. So this seminar, can we suggest uh, to the government of India to increase the basic need of the Northeast? Number three, can we speed up the DPR of this Caledon, uh, Caledon Hydro project? Caledon Hydro project is taken up since 19, uh, 1992. But till today, the project DPR cannot be completed. Then we, the state government, expected around 700 megawatt. As we know this morning, we, need, we badly needed the power the DPR cannot be completed. So this, uh, this Kaladan River is coming from Myanmar and coming inside Mizoram and going back to Myanmar. Then, without affecting too much, we can have a lot of 
uh, we can have a lot of pro, uh, power pro, uh, potentiality there in Kaladan River. That is the big gas river coming from Myanmar and going back to Myanmar. Then we, the government of Mizoram, can have a lot of potentiality in this area. Number three. So number four. This Kaladan, this seminar uh, focus on the gateway of South gateway. Uh, to Southeast Asia what need to be done. As I'm a local authority of the Southeast from Long Lai, Lai Autonomous District Headquarters, then right from the beginning, we are very much support all activities where the government take up. But till today, inside the Myanmar and inside our India, that in Mizoram, we Lai District peoples are openly support, but most of the peoples are not getting their land acquisition and compensation act also. This morning, the industrial commissioner reflect the area. Some misinformation is coming. But inside the Myanmar, there's a lot of, much more than that, than India, this land acquisition compensation act. But the, after Modiji ministry, the budget is increased from Zhou Chachua to Akiap is around only 200 km. From Zhou Chachua to Longkla is only 98 km. Since this gateway of Northeast, gateway of Southeast is open, for the whole Northeast run can be enjoy the economic development and our future. So if this question if the three questions can increase or can suggest this seminar, that will be the fruitful. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, uh, all those who raised questions. I think we'll take time to respond to the questions now. I don't know who to call to respond it. Um, maybe any of the resource persons or some of our organizers, General Mukherjee or yeah, somebody? Yeah. Yes. yes, please. Anyone who wants to respond. Um, I would like to respond to some of the queries uh, uh, and ideas. Some of the queries raised by Babu, um, Devendran, and uh, uh, their student. Um, now, after um, Modi became prime minister, um, it has become uh, fashionable uh, to talk about uh, Skill India. Um, that is after 70 years of, almost 70 years of uh, uh, independence. And uh, there are many uh, reports uh, um, uh, um, which revealed that uh, um, not only in Northeast uh, region, entire country, 80% of our graduates in professional studies as well as uh, in other studies, uh, they don't have um, employable skills. As, as teachers, as faculty in higher education institutions, sometimes we wonder our students are so good, they perform so well in examinations, they possess a, a good behavior. But we feel very sad uh, when we uh, uh, came to know that uh, they're working uh, in a small uh, jobs. They are underselling themselves. It is not that uh, uh, products are bad. Of course, we are the people responsible for producing the products. And we feel uh, 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 we have many talented and qualified students, but we don't have jobs in India. But when we ask uh, the people from industry, their perception is totally opposite. They feel there are n number of jobs available with them, but uh, the products are not up to the mark. So there is a wide, widening gap. There is a wide gap between uh, 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 our perceptions and uh, the industry's perceptions. So. After completing BA, BCom, or after completing MBA and BTech, if we are talking about uh, how to impart skills among our graduates, that means there is something wrong with our education system. And uh, normally, we, working in universities, we blame uh, the colleges, feeling that uh, uh, colleges uh, uh, are not up to the mark, and we are not getting uh, 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 be uh, better students. And when we ask college, student, uh, college teachers, they, they, they would blame uh, the school education 
saying that we are getting so many students which are not up to the mark. So I feel uh, the Indian higher education system is in crisis. So by the time a person completes his education, he should possess a certain basic skills. Not necessarily technical, some, some amount of technical skills, some amount of uh, uh, conceptual skills, some amount of people skills. Again, after completing MTech, after completing uh, MBA, we were sending our children to coaching centers to learn English, how to face interview. That means there is something wrong with our education system. So we need to revamp our education system. That is one thing. Another thing uh, about, uh, stu about student situation in Mizoram. True, we are in isolated uh, place. But uh, it is possible to challenge physical uh, isolation, but it is very difficult to challenge and address the psychological isolation. We know the strengths of our students. We know the virtues of our, of our students in Mizoram, in other parts of our northeastern state, especially teachers like me who have enough experience in interacting with students in other places. And our students have many virtues, but unfortunately, they are not aware of their virtues. They are not aware of their strengths. They are little low in terms of their self-esteem, their self-confidence. They are um, a little hesitant to take uh, uh, reasonable risks um, uh, risk in, li in life, in their career. And it is because of uh, lack of exposure with outside world. That is one problem. Another problem is, uh, I read somewhere that uh, in 1960s, in 1970s, when insurgency was there at, it, at, at its peak, Mizoram could produce uh, a good number of civil servants. And I came to know that uh, people belonging to Champai and uh, uh, Lungle, they used to walk down to Aizol for 10 to 15 days to take examination. So at that time, Mizoram had produced some civil servants. But now, with 25 plus departments in university, we have one NIT here. We have many number of colleges here. And uh, uh, we have some centrally funded institutions, not only in Mizoram, in other parts of uh, North, uh, Northeast India also. But the problem is, and, and our students are quite good in competing with the uh, UGC net examination, not less than in any other state. Um, if you take uh, um, uh, students who, who qualified in national level test, per thousand population, we are not less. But the problem is why we are not able to produce at least a single civil servant a year. Is it because our aspirational level is low? Not that we are not competent, not that we are qualified, but maybe somewhere our ambition level is low, our aspiration level is low, and maybe we are more, uh, um, um, uh, very much preoccupied with our social life. Maybe there is something wrong with uh, the family system, the school system, what we are teaching in the school and in colleges. I think we need some introspection, as mentioned by, uh, as mentioned by some speakers this morning. Uh, this is only to share my, my, my uh, concern for our own students. And uh, definite answers may not be available with us, but we, this is time to think. Thank you, sir. Uh, just uh, request everybody to be brief so that a lot more questions could be asked. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, let us all be brief. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I would seek your indulgence. A uh, few comments that I thought I might make during the session I chaired, we deferred to this session. Uh, these are <coughs> relating to some of, the, some of the observations and points made yesterday and today. For example, General John Mukherjee, I think, observed about the wastage of, uh, about the damage to environment by the roads we are constructing. Now, this is a thing which I had also thought over for some time. After seeing uh, these roads during the last few years after my return from Delhi, it's a tremendous damage has been caused both above the road as well as the road by landslide. This is a matter which I think the planners and the <coughs> engineers have to think, even including maybe uh, uh, <coughs> changing the alignment slightly, or in some cases, constructing a narrower roads. 
That is one thing. And the general has also raised about the possibility of uh, maintenance by villagers. Now, this is a very important point, and it has often crossed my mind. But of course, I knew that in the 70s, this was tried. Not, on, not merely maintenance, but even construction by the, uh, by the villagers <coughs> on the sections near their villages. But it was not very successful. But I think this is a very good suggestion and worth considering by the department. And then on talking of roads, I think I have to, we, must, we must also know that we have ancient roads in Mizora from, Bar from Burma. There are traces of this. And as such, you now Mizoram has all be, always been looking east, or we have been looking west from the, across the Teo River. So this is a matter which we have to think of. And uh, therefore, there's a lot of these heritage sites on both sides of the border have to be connected. and. Uh, uh, the potential huge uh, tourist, uh, 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 tourist uh, destinations, and therefore I think it would be very good if the uh, PW department, uh, PW department, takes this into consideration. Regarding the railway line, I have always said that a railway line from Barabi to to Sairang. I envisaged being extended to Situe, Situe, Akiep in Burma, and then on to Rangoon, and then to Southeast Asia. Similarly, I had visualized that the national highway will be along this, the, same, the same route. And then there are just one or two more points. Um, for the trade about this thing, I just want to clarify for the information of the uh, audience and also from, from members from outside that we used to have in the British days and even after independence, 40 miles inside, 40 miles that side was free for all. And after the disturbances, it was reduced to 25 kilometers as far as I know. The latest points that I do not know, but now, it is necessary to take some permissions from here and there. But I think that one day we shall have what has been mentioned by, I think, Dr. General Roy, uh, like the Indo-Canadian border, which I have mentioned in one of my articles also. And similarly, the border with, Myanmar, uh, with, with uh, Bangladesh would be much soft, uh, softened. And, uh, we have had very encouraging words from the, uh, from the Bangladesh minister, and I hope that this will be followed up. Lastly, the point I want to make is that uh, the issue of perception is a real issue in Mizoram. And um, we, there is apprehension that we may be swamped by us from people from outside Mizoram. Now, this is a, that is a matter which has been, has, which has been of much concern to most of the civil, civil society. But it is encouraging to hear, as I say, from uh, Mr. Baumik, that uh, Bangladesh requires a lot of people. They don't want to send so many people outside. It's uh, that sort of thing has come. And on our part, we have to know. On our part, we have to know that the world is getting smaller and smaller. And unless we prepare ourselves and be very qualified people, there is always a danger that we may be swamped in some way or the other. And therefore, we need very, a good gover governance which will uh, implement and uh, enforce the protection uh, measures that we have, the regulations we have, is very judiciously and efficiently. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Yes. I think I didn't uh, 
actually find time to elaborate this when I was making this point. You know, this whole fear that Bangladesh and, you know, in, incursions, illegal migration, people will be swamped. There is an absolute change of policy in Bangladesh. During the time of the military governments there, and I'm sorry to say with so many generals around, you know, the Bangladeshi generals thought, ah, surplus population, let's dump them. Let them go to India. Ah, we are spared of our liability. And, you know, we will do our business properly. The new government of Bangladesh, and I've interacted with a number of ministers, very interesting thing I will tell you. What is the biggest export of Bangladesh? Where Bangladesh makes most money? Garments. 200 rupees shirt. Yeah? Better than your bloody Reed and Peter England and anything. And will last me at least five years. Second sector where Bangladesh makes most money is remittance. Bangladeshis go abroad, work and send back money. Now the Bangladesh Overseas Expatriate Employment Minister, Nurul Islam, who also writes BSc alongside his name. I don't know why. What is the big deal in being a BSc? But he writes that. Nurul Islam, BSc. So apart from asking him this, I asked him the question about, uh, you know, several agreements that Bangladesh has recently signed with a number of countries for exporting labor. And he told me something very interesting. He says illegal migrants don't send back money. Because illegal migrants go to a country, settle down there, integrate there, and never look back to the home country. They don't send back money. And they are a lost asset as far as we are concerned. But somebody who goes from here, works in some other country, and sends back money because he's an official migrant. His uh, migration has been processed through the government. And Bangladesh today has 17 such agreements with different countries of the world in Africa, from Africa to Malaysia, everywhere. Yeah? So they are saying we don't want to go, want our labor to go waste. If our people go abroad, we want them to go with proper passport, visas, so that they can make bank accounts there and they can send back money. Because only a legal migrant is going to send back money. So, and now with this threat of terrorism and all that, the new government in Bangladesh, which is a secular government, a family government, they are also trying to you know, influence, uh, make some change in the way they send their labor abroad. So Hassanullah Inu, who is the cultural minister, information minister, told me, I would prefer somebody from Bangladesh not to go to Saudi Arabia, where they become more fundamentally Muslim, because as Muslims, they have to live like proper Muslims there and not a Bengali lifestyle that they live back in Bangladesh, you know, liberal, easy going. So I would rather want my people to go to Australia. A, they may make more money. B, they will be less fundamentalist. Because all these expatriate Bangladeshis, they go there, they become fundamentalists, and they come back and create trouble in Bangladesh. So a lot of things have changed in Bangladesh. It is, you know, and this is something, I will say as a media person, I've always argued, you know, that there should be cross-border media exchange, you know. So that our television channels here get stories from Bangladesh, some Bangladesh media, and we send them stuff and they can use our stuff. So that you are informed about the changes in these countries. So that you don't have a stereotype view, you know, what Bangladesh was in 1980s. General Ershad never bothered about migration. He thought, Jane do, mein, India mein jayega, let him go. You know, and uh, he will, of course, you know, he will say very good things now that he is, a, you know, a leader, a political leader. But that is what it was. Bangladesh has changed enormously, not only in its economy, the way it is booming up. Look at the growth rate, 6% plus. And all this happens because there is change of thinking in the country. They are looking at everything from a very economic point of view now. And they are thinking, labor is our asset. Let us not waste it. If these guys illegally migrate, they are lost to us. They will live in Assam. They will make all their money there, spend it there or northeast, wherever. They are not going to send back any money to Bangladesh. But if they are going with a proper passport, visa, agreement, you know, and living in some other country, they are sending back money. Because remittance is the second biggest sector of foreign exchange income of Bangladesh. And with it is because of this big foreign exchange income that they have, they even dare to do big projects like the big bridge, six kilometer bridge on Padma River, which is one of the most toughest rivers, with their own resources. They had a problem in the World Bank. They told the World Bank to get lost. India will not dare do it. Yeah, it was a $2 billion project. 
They told the World Bank, you're not doing it, you're wasting time, you're asking too many questions, get lost. We'll do it with our own resource. How did they do it? They said so many expatriate, 25 billion income, you know, coming into our system every year. Padma bond. Padma bond means more than the normal bond or the certificates, 0.5% jada interest dega. So they will invest in Padma bond and using the Padma bond money, they are raising their own resources. So Bangladesh, please make sure, you know, and I'm saying this because we know Bangladesh quite closely. I'm a Tripura man. We, you know, for me, Bangladesh is a bigger reality than far off Gujarat or something, you see? I don't know anything about Gujarat, but I know Bangladesh. I can tell you, I can assure you I know Bangladesh. I'm telling you, Bangladesh has changed enormously. It's not the bottomless basket case that Kissinger said it was. The Americans thought this country will sink on its own. Pakistan will sink. Believe me, it will, but Bangladesh will not. You know why? Because they are not going overboard on this religion business. Mr. Baumik, I am sorry to interrupt. Yes. The governor is arriving. When he arrives, shall we all rise in our seats and then we'll momentarily suspend the discussion, but we'll resume it after he's settled. Your Excellency, sir, we have been having our open house session, and the closing session is to start at 4. I am told that we can carry on and the discussions can go on for some time. Yes. yes. Thank you, sir. Um, <clears throat> questions have been raised by the students as well as teachers, and responses have been made, and it, it's going on. Now, we still have time, some little time, to continue to raise questions uh, and make comments also from what we heard yesterday and today. Time is open. Yes. Uh, Professor Chona. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Hello. Uh, just to respond to some of the questions raised by the participant. Regarding skill development, as you all know, we have a separate ministry now. They are working full time and a new skill development and entrepreneur policy is being drawn up in 2015. And we have a big organization, National Skill Development Council. And this organization is carrying out, carrying out skill gap analysis for each state. And at the same time, they are conducting at the district level. Okay? Now, we have a separate sector skill councils. So every trade, we want to make it skill relevant. It should be credit based and it should be acceptable a uh, world class. Wherever you go, the credit we earn through the skill, uh, skill council uh, credit will be accepted all over the world. And the credit we get should be bankable. Bank must be ready to finance whatever skill we are getting from that sector skill. So we are going to have a new landscape of higher education in the future to come. Higher education will be more and more skill related. These general course will be going in the backside and conventional courses like MA in such and such degree is irrelevant. This is what we realize at the moment. India is having uh, such and such population dividends. But if the populations are not equipped with skill relevant for today, it is nothing. Okay, it is a burden. So skill development is very crucial and not only the present government even before that they realize the importance of skill development so the present government is continuing in a greater emphasis so, so things will be changing and the response we have at the higher education level at the moment is also in respect of uh, UGC having a community college concept being uh, canvas at the college level, okay? Community college. At the same time, we are also able to provide uh, BVO courses, provided you get the necessary funding from UGC. Such proposal is there, and all university departments are entitled to apply for that, okay? So many universities in India are now 
Besides introducing these conventional courses, they are start having value-added degree through these uh, skill development courses. Now, regarding uh, the kind of uh, benefit policy initiative that government of India is extending, what we come to know is that this NEIPP was operationalized since 2007, except for some. In the hilly states, many of the provisions are irrelevant. We don't have more industries coming up because of this new initiative. So it is a high time. We need a relook, a revisit of whatever incentive policy framework we have been getting from government of India. This is a high time to relook. And that will be a part of what our industrialists talk about. We need to relook, revisit. It does not serve our purposes. It does not, add, uh, it does not create any more industries. Except in uh, transport subsidy, we are getting some few crore are flooding Mizoram. No, except for some. No industrial uh, initiative is coming up because of this uh, notice industrial and investment policy. Now, in regard to border trade, I think the idea of border trade is <coughs> archaic, not relevant in the present world. So border trade must be replaced by international trade. Border trade concept is not relevant anymore at the moment. So I think the Ministry of Commerce also should have a reality check on what really happened in the border trade. It is no more relevant. It should be international trade. Border are becoming more and more meaningless. So we need to see the impacts of technology and the impacts of ideology. So these are some of the responses I could have. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, sir. Uh, good afternoon. I am Colonel Arijit. I am Commandant 39 Assam Rifle. Uh, first, I'll give you some information regarding skill building, and secondly, I've got a query for uh, General Mukherjee. Coming into the information part, there has been a lot of talk on the skill building part. I must inform all of you that Assam Rifle has been doing a great in this area. We have been imparting skills to the local youth in the far-flung areas where majority of the educational institutions are not existing. We are imparting skills in terms of uh, electrician's course, plumbing course, carpentry, driving and maintenance, and so on and so forth. So Assam Rifle is doing a lot in this regard. Now coming to my questions to General Mukherjee. Sir, economy and security are two interrelated issues. A strong economy essentially requires a strong security. Again, a strong security necessitates a strong economy because security costs money. Now in this context, how do you perceive India's security concerns in Southeast Asia is being addressed through, the, in, through India's look east or the act east policy? I'll take on a series of issues. I'll take your question on last. A uh, few points that have been raised. The first issue is really, I think what has been broadly accepted by all of you is that you do want Mizoram to be the gateway to Southeast Asia. I don't think I've heard a single voice against it. In fact, uh, all of you have spoken for it. But the issue still remains, whilst there's a question mark, there's no question mark in your minds that you'd like to do it. But I have a big question mark in my mind, as did Poo Zothan Kuma, the Commissioner for Trade and Commerce. Are you ready? Answer is capital N-O. You're not ready. That, is also, that has also very clearly emerged. In whatever field you take, I'd put across to you, even if you take the Kaladan project, or you take the uh, Serche, Champai, Zokatar route, linking on via Mamith on the other side, onto uh, Manu in Tripura, and then onto Agartala and Bangladesh, 
at least 10 years more gestation time for your communications to develop. So you have 10 years to wake up and get ready. If you don't wake up and get ready in these 10 years, you will not be the gateway to Southeast Asia. Let's be very clear on that. Now, in order to do that in 10 years, what is required, <laughs> I'd say the start point is for Mizoram government to really form a committee of experts who work out a master plan. If this is what you want, what the people of Mizoram want, then put down this committee of experts to work out a time-bound master plan as to what needs to be done. And it must be time-bound to be completed within, I'd say, maximum three months, which will include detailed aspects of survey, how many people required to be trained in what skills, what sort of industry is to be set up, what sort of industry in the service sector is to be set up, what land reforms need to be done, what environmental reforms need to be done, how do you move people away from the urban sector back into agriculture? There are 101 things you can talk about which I'd covered during the summing up points. But this committee of experts is mandatory. Otherwise, you're just floating around in the dark, talking at random. That I'm going to set up uh, skills units in university and colleges without knowing what you want to do. So that's your start point. And uh, when we do do the summing up a little later, you'll find there's a tremendous amount of work to be done in order to get ready for that. So that would be my first recommendation to the government of Mizoram uh, as a result of this seminar, as also for the government of India to help you out in this respect, because even con connectivity has to built in, be built into this. As we talked about yesterday, that superintendent in the DC's office, an old man, he says, there's an elephant head and there's a thin stick below it. Nothing connects up. One is funded by Ministry of External Affairs. The other is done, another part of it's done by Ministry of, uh, of Roads and National Highways. Third part is done by donor. Fourth part is done by the state government. They're not matching. So they've all got to be dovetailed together. That's why this committee of experts has to sit down on everything, on all aspects of this development process. So that covers the aspect of skills. Uh, the gentleman from the bamboo industry, uh, may I get your name, please? Uh, sir, I request you, uh, you to get in touch with uh, the two Sadarjis at Bernie Hart. They have imported equipment large scale from, uh, from Japan uh, for their bamboo projects. How they have done it? Because they have done it in conjunction with the government of Meghalaya. I am sure if you contact them and find out how they have done it with the government of Meghalaya and very expensive equipment, contact them, then grab hold of the Commissioner of Industries uh, in um, uh, Mizoram. Yes. They import the Ministry of Commerce uh, authorized the DGFT Shillong to issue a license for a period uh, for two, up to two crore only. So suppose if I import more than five crore, I have to go to Calcutta, then go back to Shillong, then go back again to Sh Calcutta. The same problem I faced last two, two years back. That's all then, I'm asking you to do because... That uh, is why if the author if the issuing authority power is increased, DGFT Shillong, then or if the government introduced every office in every district I've noted state. down this point and I'll put it okay. in the recommendations. Thank you, sir. But I would request you to please contact those two Sadajis at Bernie Hart because Bernie Hart. none of the equipment they, they have imported costs less than 14 crores. I physically gone around their factory in detail. So I'd request you to do that. And I request you also to take a detailed look at them, as also at the Seep Sagar factory that has come up. There's a lot to learn from others. Also take a look at the, fact, the Tripura factory that has gone up. 
it's worth going around. You learn a lot. I know. I know. And they're also doing excellent work. So take a look at them. It doesn't hurt you to learn. Then the next point I have is your worries about migration. Whether you like it or not, 2011 census, uh, uh, 2011 census, your population was 1.1 uh, million. By now, I think you're about uh, 15 lakhs or so. But whether you like it or not, this 15 lakhs is spread all over Mizura. You have very little manpower for labor. I don't think any of you can, any industry can survive in Mizoram without importing labor. You just can't function. So whether you like it or not, you're going to have to change your work permit system and accept that foreigners will come in and work, otherwise you won't develop. What has happened? With literacy, all you want is white color, color and blue color jobs. Nothing else. You're not prepared to work in the fields. You're not prepared to go and do agriculture anymore. That being the case, whether you like it or not, you're going to have to import labor. And I assure you, Bangladeshis are not going to come in in big numbers. It will actually be people from Assam who are without jobs. It will be people from Manipur who are very badly off. They will come and work. But you have to allow them to come in. Otherwise, there's going to be nobody to work your fields or work your industry, even if you develop. So please remember that. That will be one of the reforms you have to undertake. And you will have to lump it and accept it. And accept the changes, the social changes that come along with it. The next point is regarding Kaladan. Again, it would be part of my recommendations to the government of uh, Mizoram. Because uh, even when I was in service, uh, how many years ago was that now? Uh, I retired in 2004. Ten years before I retired, when I last went around Mizoram in 1975, that time the Kaladan project was being thought about. That time I didn't go around in a vehicle. I went around on foot. There were no roads in most of the places. But the fact remains is, I was told, you buy land near Parwa, the highway will go through there. By, by the time it comes through, you will get tons of money. And therefore, what the government of Mizoram has to work out is a rational policy of compensation, not payment of the sky. It has to be a rational policy of compensation. Today, the entire Kaladan project is stuck because of that. That road will not go through unless you evolve proper laws to resolve that issue. The point about um, uh, hydroelectricity projects on the uh, Kolodain or uh, the Kaladan River is very valid. Even Tepai Mook is valid. Please do remember that your wealth will actually come from the following. From hydroelectricity export, from gas export, and I assure you, you've got plenty of gas. It has to be found and, and the gas fields developed. Agriculture, horticulture, and entrepreneurship. And, of course, the service sector. That's where your wealth will come from. So you must develop these aspects, which are your assets. Then the next point was regarding Lai District. A lot of uh, aspects not being attended to. It's not only Lai District. What, uh, Mizor the advantage Mizoram has and I uh, tell my wife, and I, I've even told the chief minister a number of times, Mizoram has a tremendous advantage that 60% of your community is Mizo. Therefore, you're relatively homogeneous. 
But the other 40% can't be neglected, otherwise you'll have trouble on your hands. So when I went around Mamit, I found Mamit in a bad way. Lai, Mara, that entire area is again not what it should be. So you must not only concentrate on developing ISO, but you have to look at your periphery of the areas where your minorities are and look after them. I'm going to make a comment at this stage. I hope I'm wrong. But I have strong reports to suggest I'm right. We had invited the Myanmaris to this seminar. They haven't come. My reports are that they were told not to come by their government. I'm saying this openly and frankly. Now, whether you like it or not, what is reality? Reality is, you are primarily a Christian state, they are a Buddhist state, and they are concerned. They are also concerned that in Chin Hills, they had insurgency before, which was backed by Mizora, openly backed by Mizora, where sanctuary was given to rebels from the other side. So that fear is still in their minds. So they would be not too worried about dealing with government of India, but they would be worried at the moment with the government of Mizoram or the Mizos directly. Because the people in power are the Myanmaris, not the Chins, even though you've got a vice president who is a Mizo Chin. So what you're going to have to do is, you're going to have to mend fences with the Myanmaris. The Mizos are going to have to mend fences, not the Indian government. The Mizos are going to have to mend fences with the Myanmaris and befriend them much more. Otherwise, the gateway won't open up. When I went round a month and a half ago, not a single road has come up on the Myanmar side. Your roads are developing rapidly. You're cursing the government, saying it's delayed. But your roads are coming up. Yes, there are delays. There's no doubt about it. But they're coming up. Today, you can drive along the Kalaran route, though you can't go across bridges. But you can drive almost right up to the border, to the Myanmar border. But there's nothing on the other side. After getting to the border, what? The same with Zokatha. Nothing to connect Ri with Tidim. So you're going to have to befriend uh, the Myanmaris, and I'm going to put that down in recommendations. A lot more contact to befriend them and allay their fears. You're going to have to be good to the Chakmas who are Buddhists. The Myanmaris are good Buddhists. I'm being very frank with you. These are my readings of the situation. Similarly, whether you like it or not, you're going to have to do much more to befriend Bangladesh, because not a single road from the Bangladeshi side is in good condition leading to the Mizoram border. Or there is not a single road really at the moment. The same from your side. So it's mental connectivity with Bangladesh as also physical connectivity. So you're going to have to put in a lot of effort to do that. Even though the minister has been wonderful in coming here and made a tremendous effort for which we are all indebted, but you have to do this. Last point I'll, I'll take on was in reference to security. What you said is valid. Whether one likes it or not, we've got insurgent groups who have taken sanctuary across the border in Myanmar and are still in sanctuary there, and are in sanctuary in Yunnan, in China. Bangladesh has demand, done a tremendous job and pushed out the Indian insurgent groups almost in entirety from Bangladesh. But there is the Indian fear, the Indian fear of infiltration, therefore you've got a huge big border fence coming up all over. 
And people are thinking of putting a border fence on the Myanmar side also. So whilst you want seamless borders, you have got to think of how to soften these borders up, at the same time maintain security and do a balancing act between the two. So you're still going to require border security, but softer border security with the entry more or less as a much freer flow at entry points, selected entry points. So it can't be totally the Canadian system or the European system of a totally open border. And therefore, what it boils down to is whether we like it or not, there are two aspects to it. It's not only international trade. It is also border trade. You can't run away from border hearts. The local people will want local trade. So you're going to have border hearts at selected checkpoints in your fences. And in addition to that, you are also going to have to have international trade along main check checkpoint routes. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Take on another two, three questions.